Hello. Great overcast day for diffused light. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, due to downtime being available because of holiday leisure, this is a scripted video. Is Suzanne Chiani shamanistic? I would say yes. Not a shamaness. No, a shamanistic. It's the early spiritual seeking form alongside older musical traditions expressing itself through instinct. That's the main idea here. More on this will follow. First off, who is Suzanne Chiani? She is a trailblazer in the field of electronic music composition and especially important for my interests, uh, tastes and beliefs, maintained and maintains a strong affinity for analog synthesizer gear. I had known who she was for decades without realizing it, but roughly two years ago was gifted by happenstance of the YouTube algorithm access to some of her more recent work with, yes, an audience full of men roughly my age sitting with rapt attention, hypnotized, mostly speechless. Now, what had caused all this? Now, decades passed and rather somehow unfairly my five-year-old brain was not prepared for this, a kid's show called 321 Contact ran on PBS in the early 80s and a segment that was probably recorded in 1979 that I would have first seen around 1985 had these two very nice looking women with pleasant voices talking about how sound works scientifically and hooking up an analog synthesizer to an oscilloscope. And you see how formative childhood memory is influential. Years later, I would assemble similar things myself and go to Stereolab concerts with the naively subconscious, logical, yet erroneous expectation that analog electronics and music would somehow be associated with very good-looking women. When I think for me that only happened mm, twice and it was a coincidence. What really happened was that a, for example, Stereolab concert would be full of guys like me. Probably many who had also forgotten that they had also once watched Suzanne Chiani around the age of five and quietly looked around the audience to find, yes, a very effective means of finding many other guys like them. Probably best for me to uh, keep that under advisement for my own self, but yet still, I'm grateful that the early childhood conceptual education in electronics and music happened from that uh, fun episode of the TV show. Several of those Stereo Lab concerts were utterly amazing. I may not have paid attention had I not had that in my uh, memory banks, so to speak. Shamanistic women with music has been a recent trend through past decades, despite the very real bias that I and honestly very many men have to admiring women who make beautiful and unearthly noises with electronics. This was even a thing in the 19 teens and 20s when newspaper authors wrote stories of discovering a quote, voice of an angel on the radio waves when the pioneering medium itself still lent an aura of mystery and allure to the identity of any woman broadcasting, but maybe it still does. All those ASMR videos are no accident. At various times in history, the figure of a woman as gatekeeper of the eternal, or at least medium to the divine, comes up. You see this in paintings, statues all over the place. Literarily, you have Cassandra for Troy, you have the Pythia Oracle at Delphi, religiously as the most famous examples, on a more brutal level would be the German women alluded to in, I think, Tacitus and elsewhere who would torture and kill Roman prisoners of war and examine the entrails to advise the tribal German generals on what steps to take next. The late Bronze Age Mycenaean culture had the, had the snake women 
an echo of which still survived roughly a thousand years later in the person of Olympia, the mother of Alexander the Great. She was from what is today Albania, a geography that preserves and encourages a kind of rough and untamed social energy. Have we seen a recent expression of women lost at the gates of the infinite? I think so. There was a peak of sorts in the early to mid 20 teens of people, men and women both, but especially women, dragging enormous amounts of sonic effects gear on stage and then using only a small part of it to make acoustically challenging soundscapes. Or at least that seemed to be the idea. Was there something more fundamental than the product cycle of trust fund cash into effects pedals, projector screens, and early Instagram accounts? Yes. I'll go so far as to say this. It is well established in Spengler and elsewhere that music has been the main art form of what we call the West, starting with the Crusades and the Gothic and the Gregorian chant cycles. The cathedrals themselves were very often shaped around the sound. Walk through a uh, well-made, uh, the smaller it is, the more noticeable it is, the lower the latency and effectively lower euphonic impedance. But um, a small, well-made, genuine Baroque, not neo-Baroque, chapel in Germany or Italy or even Mexico. I've seen really good ones in Italy. And it becomes obvious how the acoustic focal point shaped by features like a broken pediment, it goes like this, but it goes down in there, you know, one of those things, by a broken pediment, I broke my train of reading, broken pediment or an oblong apse, that is where you have um, an oval dome where it ends in a little thingy in the wall and it makes a little parabolic kind of echo projection chamber. So, these visual features create a social focus point at exactly, an acoustic sonic uh, focal point at exactly where a priest or cantor would stand before the altar. The ancient Greek theaters had this also, marked by a fixed bronze disc on the, uh, on the floor of the stage in front of the, uh, the, the proskinium. But tellingly, the Greeks placed a statue of Dionysus at that point, instead of believers passing through it as would happen in a Catholic communion liturgy. The Greeks understood body, where the Faustian Westerners understood space. So it is established that the West venerated music and that this cult in the same way that the Greeks venerated sculpture and that this culture, the Western culture, has in the past 150 years transformed and or ossified into a non-creative, finalized form. This implies two things. A disassembly of the conventional forms of the West as well as new creative energy expressing itself through these either broken or fossilized forms. Jazz was the beginning of this in popular music um, kind of the, the atonal stuff in classical establishment music. Jazz came out of the ethnic energy of what has been called an internal proletariat, specifically New Orleans music, as observed by Louis Armstrong. Uh, the Irish, Jewish, and African-American people taking the instrumentation of the German-rooted Sousa march, and from this soup, making the various branches of jazz with the more simplified blues source coming from the places connected to New Orleans as hinterlands. That's Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas. And it was they were delivering uh, urbanized, an urbanized rural energy, rural energy that became urbanized to the new musical genres. Muddy Waters and Bob Dylan are very good examples of this. And uh, of course, Mr. 
formerly known as Mr. Robert Zimmerman, grew up near the source of the, we were talking about how it goes to New Orleans, he grew up near the source of the Mississippi River, um, near enough, in Hibbing, Minnesota. So such figures um, of urbanized rural energy specifically had going electric as a, a monumental threshold. And uh, these were the main embodiments of the historical vectors of the development of the mainstreaming of jazz and, and blues there. While in the early to mid 20th century, establishment composers like Schoenberg, Stravinsky, and Prokofiev were consciously disassembling the older traditions. They were being consciously atavistic with the primitive tribal yearning of something like the Rite of Spring, uh, later beautifully ripped off by, uh, uh, by John Williams for uh, both Close Encounters of the Third Kind and uh, Jaws. So the plot of the Rite of Spring, of this Degaliev ballet, is that a vaguely Viking-like Slavic woman from the Bronze Age, I didn't advise Degaliev on his historical research, um, this woman is chosen to ritualistically dance herself to death. Uh, the jazz music and blues welling up in the Americas from the anti-establishment crossing over into establishment in opportune figures uh, such as Miles Davis, Elvis, the Beatles, and Mick Jagger. Uh, a new expression of energy that effectively ended uh, with that blues for white urban and suburban people known as punk. That's what punk is. It's blues for comment below. You guys, comment below. Yeah, punk is blues for white, urban, and suburban people. That's what it is. So you had a sometimes literal shaking apart of the old music traditions, and the body itself returned as active in this experience, when the body had earlier been abstracted away into intellect in the era of classical music. During the classical music era, dance was relegated to on stage or to a formalized real or gavotte dancing and became highly formalized. The audience was expected to silently and motionlessly watch and contemplate in a very Apollonian way. And by the 60s, the Dionysian had been repressed to the point of actually screaming just to be noticed. Take Jim Morrison, Iggy Pop, and Patti Smith as examples there. In the late 80s and early 90s, there was a conscious reassertion of the musical energy of the 60s. Look up Paisley Underground and listen to Billy Corgan's interviews and look at what he was wearing when he still had long hair. R.E.M., same pattern a few years earlier. Michael Stipe loved Sid Barrett and had antipathy for what he felt Roger Waters did to, quote, ruin Pink Floyd. Roger Waters actually tells a story about this. He thought it would be fun to hang out with Michael Stipe and he loved Ariam's music. And then in, in the green room where he thought he was going to like have a discussion about music, all Michael Stipe did was just like, he just stared at, him, <laughs> stared at him for like 45 minutes. So that went nowhere. So all of this retro stuff, this was called alternative, as many of us remember. For a while, it was alternative to the mainstream of things like Paula Abdul, nauseating things like Paula Abdul dancing on a Coke commercial with Elton John. I think a giant piano was involved. Um, Bowie with the horrible music before his Tin Machine Renaissance, that kind of thing. But that can never... Uh, something being alternative, avant-garde, what have you, that can never last forever. And the 1990s alternative new energy literally wore old clothes. It was not innovative, it was retro. But it was and still is good. Something genuinely began to morph and change and innovate, uh, which was perhaps more intensely retro in some ways but also futuristic in others. That's why they called it post-rock. Um, 
something genuinely began to morph and change with a group like Stereolab, and I should mention Radiohead. Yes, I'm going to mention Radiohead. I don't get excited about them, but yes, Radiohead's important. The only reason they are mentioned alongside Stereolab in the popular press is because no one knew how to categorize either of these groups. They really had nothing to do with each other, and that's no no disrespect to either of them for that, but they, it's, it makes no sense to group them together, except the fact that they both... Uh, broke the mold, so to speak. So, something genuinely began to morph and change with a group like Stereolab in the mid-90s, using beautiful-sounding analog synths that had been all but abandoned in the 80s for the horrible clang clash of a digital Yamaha DX7 and the cheap ease of digital programming of sound, composition, and performance with... Uh, Composition and performance with analog gear like a Minimoog and the pure knob panel of the VCS-3. With all of that, a new kind of, of landscape opened up. Something that was barely present before that a, a genius composer like Delia Derbyshire, who arranged the original Doctor Who theme on tape loops, she languished in obscurity uh, about all of this. That type of composition and type of soundscape later on became actually popular. People would pay to go listen to someone create a sound landscape, and this person creating it was often a woman. I personally think that Suzanne Chiani, in addition to being a pioneer with such analog synth improv composition, is also the best I have had a chance to listen to. Prove me wrong. Please. Comment below. So, if new energy of new culture is coming up in the fragments and bones of the West, and it is doing so one way or another. I have been for a while convinced that waveform or resonance is the newer form of prime symbol that is slowly displacing the infinite space thought forms of the West. Cultural displacement is almost always started in an unconscious manner. It is driven by instinct, a shamanic element of uh, shamanic element accompanies such a process. The performer connects to something mysterious. They don't know exactly what they're doing or exactly where they're going, but they are very specific about the quality of the experience they want to deliver to themselves and also to the listener. M Miles Davis, by the way, was a genius at this at this method and practice and that is a kind of shamanism or at least shamanistic practice but what is it doing where is it going and what are the values and ideals none of this is yet cohesive in any form and that makes sense in such a directionless and socially turbulent time as the one we find ourselves in the only mass of people with a cohesive and sustainable, stable direction are conservatives, and their direction is proudly backward. Conscious liberalism is forward-facing, but top-down it is a totalitarian nightmare, and bottom-up it is Quaker hippies deliberating for 45 minutes about what people are going to eat for dinner. I suspect we can improve on all of this. But less ambitious for the moment, just keeping it to music and in sound. What is this art form developing into? All true art is born religious, and there is a religious yearning expressed in areas like chimatics, geometric visual embodiment of resonance. Warhol was fairly near the mark when he did a projection light show on top of the Velvet Underground in 1965 and 66, calling it the Exploding Plastic Inevitable. Connecting the visual with the sonic in a meaningful way is probably a fertile place to explore. So, 
what do all of you think? Let me know. There might even be an upcoming class on all of this when there is enough demand. I might even want it to be hands-on and based on producing uh, visual sound rather than be about reading and hearing things, but we could do that too. Let me know below. I would love to hear your thoughts and inspirations, uh, disagreements, and reactions. So as always, please like, share, and subscribe. Let other people know. Uh, so I can increase the quality of this content by having it you know, gain some momentum. To, to also grow the channel. And uh, I want to make a morning routine about the thoughts and uh, exercise and things. I'll see how that goes. I've not yet uh, found a daily video pattern that works. Might be in the edge of it. So we'll see. As always, thank you for listening. And for those of you keeping track at home, this is not early morning pipe. This is uh, Cornell and Deal Palmetto Balkan. So you can try to guess what I'll have tomorrow if you care. Have a good day. Thank you.